Okay, you are now live. Great. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julie Mayfield. I'm the chair of the Planning and Economic Development Committee for the City of Asheville, and I'd like to welcome you to our October meeting. Um, as has been the case for the last several months, all council members and staff are participating virtually, and we appreciate your patience as we work through uh, holding these committee meetings virtually, and um, we know they are not always problem-free, so just uh, appreciate your patience with that. To help our audience follow along, I'll state each section of the agenda aloud. We are streaming live on our virtual engagement hub, which is accessible through the virtual engagement hub link on the front page of the city's website. We also have an option for the public to listen live by phone by dialing 855-925-2801 and entering the code 8187. I'll give you that again, 855-925-2801, and the code is 8187. And for those of you out there uh, joining us virtually, uh, welcome. For today's meeting, we have the option also for people to call in and comment live during the meeting. And we will have four opportunities to do that. Today, we're voting on three things, and then there'll be public comment at the end. To call in and comment live, please use the same phone number, 855-925-2801, and the meeting code still is 8187. Your phone will be muted and you will hear the meeting live. At this point, callers will hear, for more options, press star. Pressing star will allow callers to continue to listen live and join a speaker queue. Callers should only join the speaker queue during the agenda item they wish to comment on. So for instance, our first agenda item is the Haywood page. If you know that you would like to make a comment on that agenda item, please call into that phone number uh, and get in the queue at that time. But if you wanna do something later in the meeting, wait until we start talking about that. And if you're watching the meeting through the live stream while you are listening to the meeting by phone, please be sure to turn the volume down on your device. All right, I will now go through and introduce all the committee members and staff who are participating virtually. For those folks uh, in the meeting, please be sure to mute your microphone, um, both before and after you speak. And obviously unmute yourself to speak. So council and staff, as I call your name, please say a quick hello. Vice Mayor Gwen Whistler. Good afternoon. Uh, new councilwoman, Antoinette Mosley. Hello. Welcome to your first PED meeting. Uh, Assistant City Manager Kathy Ball. Is Kathy there? Yeah, did Kathy say hello? Or Good afternoon. She... There Good we go. afternoon. Okay, Thanks. Uh, Nikki Reed our, uh, from our Community uh, and Economic Development Department. Hi, everyone. Rosanna Mulcahy with the Asheville Business Inclusion Office. Hello. <laughs> ah, there you are. Okay, great. Um, Aaron Miles from our legal department. Good evening, everyone. And Stephanie Dahl from Planning and Urban Design. Good afternoon. All right, we are gonna start the agenda. The first item on our agenda is approval of the minutes of our last meeting, which was just Gwen and me. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so uh, Gwen, do you have any changes to the minutes or a motion to approve? No, I'm, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes as stated. Okay. And um, Antoinette, I realize you weren't there, but is there a second? A second. <laughs> okay. All right. And I'll do a roll call. Um, Vice Mayor Gwen Whistler. Aye. And Antoinette. Aye. And I am also an aye. Great. All right, our first uh, real agenda item here is the Haywood Page, Pro Haywood Page Project update. And for this, I am pitching it to Stephanie Dahl. Thank you, Chair Mayfield, and thanks to Councilpersons Mosley and Whistler for taking the time to look at this item today. Just as a quick reminder for some of you and new for some people at home um, that 
the project that we are considering today or the plan that we are considering today really had its genesis probably 20 or 30 years ago. However, um, we were lucky to have some direction and guidance from city council four years ago that resulted in the development of a Haywood and Page vision plan that focused on building consensus in our community. And last year, we were able to have city council give us direction and authorize funding to hire Nelson Birdwaltz and a team of multidisciplinary consultants to bring the community back together and translate that vision into a design concept and also take a look at a lot of the, the preliminary due diligence that would need to take place for us to think about how we would potentially redevelop in the future city-owned properties located in and around Haywood and Page Avenues in central downtown Asheville. So I wanted to, before I introduce the consultants, just put a couple of things out there that might help clarify what we're looking for today and how we should be viewing as a community this potential concept plan. And the first piece of this is that this plan is just what it says it is, which is a concept plan. It is not a site plan that would be um, followed um, and that would be adopted by city council and then immediately be developed on. It is a vision for our community that helps us guide in the future when city council feels that uh, the community is ready, how we could go forth and potentially partner with others in our community, including a private developer on the redevelopment of the site. So. This plan is concrete enough for us to understand what we're trying to uh, accomplish here, the elements that our community is really looking for in place, but it's also flexible enough for us to be able in the future to respond to changing times. And I know right now that that is really important for everyone uh, is that we have some level of flexibility. You're going to hear uh, this afternoon from uh, uh, Yushan Lau and James Lima from James uh, Lima Planning and Development how this plan um, is also including a tool that can help you be really flexible. So uh, what has happened so far with this plan is that it has been to the downtown commission and has been to planning and zoning and it is now coming to you before potentially going to city council. Uh, planning and zoning last Wednesday gave an unanimous thumbs up to uh, advise city council to go ahead and adopt the plan as a future redevelopment guide. The downtown commission voted in the affirmative with one person um, voting in the negative. And that person um, who is Miss um, Kimberly Hunter made it uh, very clear that while she's very appreciative of the work that the community has put forward, she on principle wanted to put in a no vote because of the, the timing, um, perhaps the tumultuous timing that our community is in right now. So I thought that was important to put out there. So um, I'm available at the end of this to answer questions and to talk about uh, some of the stakeholder input that we are hearing, but let's get right to the meat and have um, Brian Schulner, who is our project manager, and Thomas Waltz, who is the um, owner of Nelson Bird Waltz Architects, start with a presentation. Thank you, Stephanie, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Thomas Woltz, owner and principal of Nelson Bird Woltz Landscape Architects, and it has been a tremendous pleasure for us to get to work with the people of the city of Asheville. Um, uh, my family is from Waynesville, North Carolina, so this has had a particular significance for me getting to uh, to debunk the Thomas Wolf myth as Thomas Woltz that you can go home again. Um, I wanted to introduce the rest of our team. We have uh, James Lima uh, and Yushan, who is on the phone with us of, of James Lima Planning and Development. We have Traffic Planning and Design, um, SKIO for uh, Public Input and Facilitation, SAMHSA Architects, uh, the, and the CDC, all as part of, part of the project. I wanted to just introduce the project by introducing um, the parallel of, of our sort of essential process in making public space and in particular in urban settings. We believe there is no empty space. Um, every space has a story and particularly in cities. And we seek to use a process of researching 
the essential ecologies and cultures that have shaped a place over time and using that as design inspiration for making a very placeful and authentic public place. Add to this the important work that the Vision Implementation Committee had been doing for several years to come up with the concept that was presented to City Council that resulted in us being hired to design this plan. And then layer into that a substantial public process. And I'll walk you through images of that where we created tours of the site, open houses, came back to the community with multiple design options. The community voted on them, incorporated their feedback, and we've come back with the final plan. So it has been a real fusion of our working process, building on the strong shoulders of the v Vision Implementation Committee's work and adding in the voice of hundreds of people from the community of Asheville. So we are very uh, proud of the process, its thoroughness and its inclusivity. We appreciate all the volunteer time that was put in by hundreds of people in Asheville to take the time to come and participate in this process. Uh, next slide, please. I'll swiftly uh, walk you through and just reiterate uh, the importance of this goal of developing a clear vision for the development of the site that positions Haywood Page as an authentic asset within Asheville's public realm. And you're seeing listed the, the partners, uh, the, neighbor, the, the, the neighborhood associations um, that have been essential in developing uh, the plan. The resulting phrase that we really want to bring to this is programmatic authenticity. This should be a place that you come and you know you're in Buncombe County, you know you're in Asheville, and you can find clues as to the history of the people uh, and ecologies that have shaped this place. Next slide, please. This is a diagram of the greater team that I've, I've already mentioned uh, the names of most of these people, but it's very important to understand this, uh, the Haywood Page Vision Committee, the neighborhoods and stakeholders, the greater community and the Asheville Design Center, all working in representation of the public voice and the planning and urban design and city council representing the city. They have fed into our process as have all of the other uh, consultants. Next, please. This district holds some of your best architecture and the best civic institutions, uh, some of the real cultural institutions of the city from the public library, the Thomas Wolfe Auditorium and the Cherokee Civic Center, as well as the St. Lawrence Basilica. We have substantial apartment buildings of, of uh, private of residences in the Vanderbilt and the, the Battery Park and also the Grove Arcade. So the fact that these rather spectacular buildings all front onto um, the, this parking area um, means this, this spectacular public space has been a long time coming as, as Stephanie mentioned, maybe 20 or 30 years. I did want to highlight that the commission at the beginning our assignment was to design those two magenta patches that you can see on the screen. Um, they are surrounded by roads, surrounded by cars, um, and divided from one another. So as we started to develop uh, our design and testing it with our traffic engineering consultants, we thought outside the box, outside the pink box, and started to strategize of how this could really maximize a beautiful urban space for this neighborhood in Asheville. And I'll show you how we went about that. Next, please. Here you're seeing just a quick analysis of what public park spaces are in downtown Asheville. And for a city of 90,000 people, it's not, not a lot. And when you think of this upper left corner, the Haywood and Page area, being also parking, you feel a, an almost urgent need for this civic uh, public space to exist. Next, please. I wanted to walk you through the timeline. We were hired almost exactly a year ago, um, and you're seeing the, the constant drumbeat of vision implementation committee check-ins, but also the big community engagement sessions, and we have images of those sessions the first on October 27th of last year, 
Then we went away, developed multiple design schemes, came back and presented those at engagement session two, February 17th and 18th. Um, had terrific turnout those two days um, with lots and lots of input that then uh, made its way into our final design that we presented um, in July to the Vision Implementation Committee on July 30th. Next, please. As I mentioned earlier, our process is really rooted in a deep appreciation and a deep amount of research into the ecological and cultural history. We believe that these are the things that shape our world, and too often we are unaware of the complicated social, often painful social histories, um, and the often fragile ecological histories of a site. Um, Buncombe County and Asheville are in one of the biodiversity hotspots of the planet Earth. You have an incredible diversity of geology and horticulture and wildlife. It is it is really a uh, one of the most special places on the planet and one of the most ancient because of the Ordovician erogeny that was the eruption of stone that led to uh, the, the Appalachian Mountains being the oldest mountain range on the planet Earth with the French Broad being the third oldest river on the planet. The, uh, the presence and stewardship of this land by the Cherokee people is something near and dear to my own family and history and something that we wanted to find a voice for in this project. A kind of connection of culture and history was that this was the Stony Hill. This was about a 78 foot tall rock mountain that was completely leveled to make the Haywood Page site, the Battery Park and the Grove um, Arcade. That was a mountain with a resort on the top that was demolished by Grove, leveled the entire site with the promise of a 25 acre park being given back to the city, a promise that never materialized. Um, we've uh, uh, had this uh, timeline that we uh, developed up on the site now for almost a year for people to come and learn all the different uh, uh, layers of history of this particular site. Next, please. This was engagement session one, and there's nothing better than getting people on the actual site to feel the scale of it, to see the lights, the movement of the cars, to understand what are the existing difficulties that this design should solve. Um, so we posted uh, uh, people around the site, gave tours of the site after a lengthy a public meeting indoors and we had this glorious sunset. So we felt like it was a blessing on the project right there at community meeting number one. Um, uh, got terrific feedback from what people wanted to see, what they thought was working and not working. The next slide, please, Brian. Um, this was a, 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 an incredible moment of unlocking the potential for this project to go beyond its, um, its initial vision. And that was something as simple as seeing the public realm being from building facade to building facade, as opposed to the public realm being what's outlined by streets. So in this sense, uh, the proposed you're seeing on the right, we're imagining that purple is the public realm with a realigned Haywood going through that, creating much more space in front of the, the Cherokee um, Civic Center, in front of the Thomas Wolfe Auditorium, uh, in front of the Pack Library, the Vanderbilt, and St. Lawrence Basilica. On the image on the left, that is your current existing condition, and the roads have just swollen over years um, and have consumed the, the civic realm in front of those buildings. So we began a conversation that has not been completed yet, but began a conversation with St. Lawrence Basilica about the potential for adding um, the parking area that is across the street from them, closest to the site, that would allow us to straighten page. And you see what an incredible benefit that makes to the public space in the image on the right. When you take that crooked, uh, the hook of page and you straighten it out and add that, you, you have a truly substantial public plaza. Next, please. These were our sort of guiding principles. Be a good neighbor, create a space that is hospitable and welcoming to all, but also feels connected to all of these institutions and facilities that surround the space. Rely on 
authentic horticulture, and I'll say also masonry and stone uh, from the region so that we communicate the identity of Asheville and Buncombe County ecologically. And then finding the balance was an essential part of this with the public input, knowing the somewhat troubled history of this site and the debates of whether it's fully developed or as park or as architecture. So finding that balance between passive and active public space <clears throat> and how much should be built. This is where the input of James Lima's organization has been extraordinarily helpful and beneficial to our process because they ran over 60 different models of what space and what building sizes working together would yield the best income for the city of Asheville and create the best improvements overall. So they will be presenting that um, terrifically empowering model that they very generously have offered to gift to the city of Asheville to continue to use as you look at this project, putting in new and evolving inputs. Next, please. After our second uh, engagement or preparing for a second engagement meeting, we developed lots of different concepts and sketches. You're seeing in many of them some similar gestures, and that is about creating universal accessibility for everyone into a space that actually straddles, I think it's about 16 or 17 feet of grade change across the site. Next, please. Um, this is showing you how the building uh, resolves that grade change. Um, so we use three-dimensional modeling and an exact uh, topographic uh, representation of the site to create these different amenities, making sure that they always met the American Disabilities Act for universal accessibility. Next, please. Here are the three schemes that we presented at community engagement number two, and we got lots of feedback, some of it very funny. One person would put a post-it saying their point, and the other person would put a post-it saying the opposite point right next to it. And that was great because then we were there to have a conversation and that yielded a lot of clarity for us to go back and complete um, a final proposal at the end of this. You can see we have the voting of each uh, of the different sites. Of uh, it, it was really uh, fantastic. And I, you know, people who were childhood friends of my parents showed up. Uh, lots of different people came to the meeting and weighed in. And it was really a, a delight for our team. Next, please. Um, this was the final sketch that collected all of that data. We did a three-dimensional model to see what those spaces would feel like um, as we built toward the final proposed plan. Next, please. Um, just a reminder of this geology and horticulture of the region that we're relying heavily on for its authenticity and, and its beauty, I've got to say. It's just such a, such a beautiful plant community. Here's the final plan. So I'll walk you through it if you, uh, with, your, with your eyes, if you'll wander up Haywood Street, walking north up Haywood, past uh, the last building, what we've done is locate the piece of architecture at the lower right-hand corner, the southeast corner of the site, continuing the street wall of Haywood Street, having an open arcade or loggia that shelters you that you walk under and into the building, a setback, and then the building rises up with a mixture of uses that you'll see when uh, James Lima presents. Moving further along the sidewalk on Haywood Street, and Brian's following my words with his cursor, if you can see on the screen, um, you turn into the Woodland Gardens. This would be a very rich ground plane and limbed up trees for great visibility, but also an immersive experience in the horticulture of our region. That is a ramp at 5% gradient, so it's an easy walk up and into the oval plaza surrounded by trees, shade, movable tables and chairs, a real convening space at the center of the city. To the south of that oval are large rock outcrops, large boulders that look at the Precambrian granite geology of our site and evoke the stony hill. The arc of the street also recaptures the base of what was the Stony Hill that was leveled in the 1920s. I want to draw your attention now to a diagonal axis that is really the thread of the center of this plaza, stitching it in up more steps, and you're on a diagonal 
to the Grove Arcade. So that becomes the civic spine of this plaza, not just having it a park surrounded by roads, but really, as I said earlier, stretching the civic realm from building facade to building facade. Moving further north, we have a collection of native deciduous uh, azaleas. And then beyond that, the raised beds of the community garden. And above that, the beacon, which is a contemplative site uh, reminding us of the many cultures and lives that have shaped Asheville from the Native American people, from the Cherokee Nation, to the first colonial settlement, to the African-American community, to the contemporary uh, citizens of today. Just below that is a kiosk that could have uh, restrooms and tools for the garden. Below that, the canopy grove and shade structure, which again is movable chairs under a, a high grove of shade trees. And then the diagonal plaza that leads you to the building on its upper level. So remember back where we started at Haywood, you're at the Haywood Street level. Here you're up at Page Street level. As you move along the back side of the building, um, what now is an alleyway, we have widened to make uh, this uh, shortcut to Page, which is a series of stairs. You have to imagine that the back side of this building has doors, windows, retail. It's very alive. It's not uh, so back of house. Um, across the street from it is also a covered area that could be for pop-up shops, food trucks, and that sort of thing we're calling the market stalls. Um, so it brings vibrance to this little gray rectangular plaza that you're seeing on the plan that has the Grove Arcade at a diagonal, the market stalls, and the park plaza and new building all flanking it. So the idea is that there's no back of house left. It doesn't feel like an alleyway, but rather like many others in Asheville, an intriguing dynamic um, um, alley. So that is the full plan. Uh, next slide, please. I'll show you um, a few images of what this could look like. This is crossing the street from the Cherokee Civic Auditorium and the, um, the Thomas Wolfe Auditorium. Um, you come up the steps into the elliptical plaza. The building on the left is not uh, designed. We did this in Photoshop to show maybe the scale of what it could be. This uh, A few ideas, though, are precise to the site, like um, uh, an entry of what could become a public use on the plaza level the central plaza. Next, please. This is uh, a, a collection of possible precedents. Again, we worked with Samsel Architects on the massing of the structure. These are some buildings that came to mind that we thought about materials and scale and quality. Again, the building is not designed, but its massing um, is the result of James Lima's study in uh, economics. For the, for the district. Next, please. Um, here you're seeing how the building section works. I think I've already addressed this in the, in the bottom. You're seeing the page elevation and the Haywood elevation. So you see that this building actually straddles the slope and the plaza level is about midway up. Next, please. Um, here, I'll turn it over to uh, Yushan and James to walk us through their um, uh, quite thorough study of the district and the economic model that they created. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yushan Luo. I'm director at James Lima Plan and Development. Our role in the project is to serve as the economic advisor for the design framework. So our overall economic approach for the Haywood Page project is to consider the holistic economic impact of improving the downtown experience. Based on the initial vision plan, we understand that the community has been weighing options of both an open space as well as real estate development on the site. And based on our national experience, we know that development and open space are not a either or situation. If well designed, they can enhance each other because a well-designed, well-maintained park, especially in a prime downtown location as Haywood Page, can greatly improve the experience for locals and tourists, making the district a better destination that can create an identity with the civic and the cultural institutions nearby, improving the quality of life and also benefiting businesses. 
and so properties that are taxable within certain distance from the park, increased value means potentially increased city revenue. And also for real estate development that's on the site, right next to such a park. In return, that can also generate revenue from taxes as well as potentially a land disposition or ground lease. And these revenues, these values can all be captured to fund the potential maintenance of such a park. Next one. So our goal here is to help the city develop a quantitative tool that can evaluate the different degrees of economic benefits associated with different types of plan. Intuitively, we know that more open space means more revenue from the surrounding parcels that's benefiting from having a park to increase their value. And more development on the site means more taxes from the project on the site. So the best combined outcome might be somewhere in the middle. Next. So we built a dynamic Excel model to analyze just that. We took the design's building information as well as program options into the model. We then had inputs of financial assumptions based on market research, as well as consultation with the city staff and private stakeholders. And in the end, the model can help answer two important questions. First, how much is the potential city revenue associated with the project going to be? And second, will the on-site development be financially feasible from a private real estate point of view? Next. So this is uh, what our Excel model looks like. It's very user-friendly, and we will be handing this model to the city so that the city can use the tool to keep planning the site and monitoring future changes in the market conditions. This tool is also very flexible, so you can put as many design ideas to the model as you wish. In the design process, we analyzed 62 different de development scenarios. I'm going to show you one example today. Next. So this is one of the 62 scenarios that we analyzed. It's a seven-story building on the site consisting of office, artist studios, retail, and also public use. Next one. So after including uh, these numbers of the program and also square footage into the model, it will tell you the potential city income associated with this plan both in terms of year-by-year -year figures, as shown in the chart above, and in terms of 20-year total net present value estimates, as shown in the table below. So in this particular ex example, the on-site development is projected to generate $3.4 million of net present value in the net city income within the next 20 years after the project's completion. So this is just one of the many examples that we analyzed, and this model will be handed over to the city. So in the future, when the city is planning to implement this plan, you will have this flexible tool to analyze the finances based on specific conversations that you will be having with the developer community. You can change the numbers about the rent, number of stories for the building, and also other inputs. So in a nutshell, uh, this flexible model is both a tool for the conceptual planning and very good for the implementation down the road. And this is Brian with Nelson Bridge Waltz. I just wanted to kind of introduce two other, um, two other points of, of work that we did with, with consultants, um, looking at uh, getting estimates for both the construction costs as well as the ongoing maintenance costs of the, of the proposed master plan. Um, so this slide is showing kind of the the, the three buckets of, um, of of projects that are going on. Um, in green is the public realm. So this is looking at the at the site plan that uh, Thomas just walked us through, and looking at the materiality and um, kind of what the expected construction costs would be. So we're kind of including that in these assumptions. Um, accounting for design fees, a 10% design phase contingency, kind of acknowledging the, the early um, concept phase and knowing that um, things will get kind of honed in and tightened down in, in future uh, development phases. And then also kind of crucial pointing out a 20% endowment. And this is just something that we think is, is crucial to mean um, an endowment existing to, to be there to ensure that there's top quality world-class 
uh, maintenance going into the project before the project is built. I think the last thing we would want is to deliver a beautiful project and then not have it be cared for. Um, so just kind of encouraging that that any um, any development on the site is, is accounting for that, that maintenance uh, moving forward. Um, the second big bucket is the is the blue area, which is just the the building component, which Yushan just walked us through. And then the third is a proposal, or sorry, a, a rough order of magnitude estimate of what it would entail to do the road project. Um, so this is a, a, a broad a broad bucket that's including both the um, the realignment of the roadways as well as the adjacent parcels um, listed on the on the diagram as A, B, and C. Uh, just to get you know a ballpark of of what the city can um, can plan for and and estimate when they're um, looking forward to implementing this. And then the last the last slide is just looking at um, expected operations and maintenance summary. So this is specifically looking at the the public realm that Thomas walked us through, um, and we worked with ETM Associates, which is a you know a, a great estimating firm that we worked with numerous times, and they basically just go through the plan and kind of quantify what the materials are in terms of square footage, and then they add kind of man hours to that. So you get a, an idea of, you know, how much ongoing maintenance and support are required to keep it looking um, stellar. Um, yeah, so that is, that's that's the gist. Um, happy, I guess, Beth, if you have anything to add, otherwise, you know, happy to, to take any questions. Thank you. This is Stephanie. Thank you very much, team. I think it would be a, a great to hear from the chair if she would like questions at this time. Yeah, let's go ahead and entertain some questions from the committee and we'll have a little discussion here and then we'll pitch it to um, public comment uh, after we talk for a little bit. So I have a couple questions, but happy for others to start. Gwen or Antoinette? Um, can you go back to like three slides ago? Um, it was the ABC, no, um, okay, right there. Can you point out to me what what's the property that, um, that in this proposal would be acquired from Basilica? That is, I, I was getting a little confused. That area would be right, right in this area as well as the, the road alignment. So roughly, if you can see my hand circling around, that's, that's yeah. this area. So that's basically their current, their parking lot that they use on Sundays? Correct, exactly. Or, well, yeah. and, and they just use all the time, okay. Um, and then, uh, um, my other question, so, uh, go one more slide um, toward the end. Okay, um, and and walk me through again. How did you come up with this hundred and ten thousand dollars, and how does that marry up with the eight hundred thousand um, endowment? I mean, it doesn't seem like. An eight hundred thousand endowment would last very long to pay for one hundred and ten thousand. So no, okay, absolutely not. I, I think the idea of the endowment is to have a fund to jumpstart um, ongoing partnerships of you know friends of the park or or a district maintenance kind of entity um, that would be responsible for for maintaining the site moving forward. Um, but in terms of kind of the the approach that. Um, ETM uses to get to this pie chart. They basically, you know, they look at, um, if I can pull up just the master plan, um, they go through and quantify the, the square footage of planting areas, the square footage of the paving materials. They look at, you know, how much is a, is a port in place concrete versus a, a stone. And for each kind of material that's incorporated into the site, they put a, a, a number of how many man hours it will take to ensure that the litter is removed, that snow is removed from the site, that um, benches are cleaned and kind of all that kind of, um, you know, ongoing maintenance so that you just have a really clear vision of, of how many man hours are, um, are anticipated to be required. Um, 
I think one kind of unique scenario is that there's a lot of overlap between, for instance, something like snow removal, would that fall under the purview of the, the building management? So there's a lot of kind of kind of grayish overlap areas that um, you know are, are unique to this project. But um, I think more than anything, it just provides a really good kind of starting point of the ballpark estimate that you should kind of have in your mind when you when you think through um, you know opportunities for for implementing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, my overall comment is it, I've I've seen this a couple times now. Um, it's beautiful and very well thought through and very expensive. So let me pick up on that. Um, we've we've gotten at least one comment, or I've had communication with um, some neighbors who. Um, I, I could have read the email wrong, but your your report sort of lays out some various funding options, right? You're, you don't make a single recommendation about how it should be funded. But so that's question number one related is, I mean, generally you're still, the, the city will still be making this massive investment in terms of the construction of it. Now, how the maintenance is dealt with going forward may be a little different, but are you, are we envisioning that this is, I mean, this, this is going to be, to do this will require significant city investment. It's not just going to rely on, for instance, the downtown association. Is that right? Correct. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Brian, do you want to talk a little bit more about the conservancy model? And I can talk about staffs experiencing with uh, experience with funding capital projects. I'm just kind of if James could kind of walk us through the you know in the in the report kind of identified some some example models of kind of similar um, projects and and funding models in kind of comparable sites um, and then from that kind of identified a couple you know recommendations of potential uh, ways to go. Sure, I just would like this is James Lima. Good to see everyone. I would just encourage us to go back for a moment and to uh, early on slide uh, which is called district assets. And it's really, it's an extraordinary slide because it shows that this is one of the most civically significant places in your city. And I have no doubt that the exhibition and meeting hall is going to book substantially more business because of this park. And more people will attend Wolf because of this park. And more people are going to come to Grove Arcade because of this park. You will have increased overall kind of district economic output. And there are models, and we haven't made specific recommendations, but there are options for there being uh, very kind of targeted, uh, limited geographic assessments for the hotels and, and some of the other commercial uses and revenue generating uses that are really benefiting from a great civic moment like this. And then we did look at the, the proximity premium and the various direct and indirect benefits of a great park that it has on your underlying tax revenue generation. So it is a way to contextualize the, the need to, to dedicate funds. That said, we always recommend that there be non-public sources of structural revenue streams to fund operations and management of the park because we all know what happens to those in government expense budgets. So we really should look at the options for how to create, again, sustained sources of revenue and earned income, including the cafes and some of the commercial revenues that we built into the on-site development that can be dedicated toward m and And you, Sean, if you want to talk about any other governance and stewardship models we can uh, uh, yeah just to add slightly so um, in the report we do have um, information about two different types of stewardship model relevancy business improvement districts which is like value capture districts that assess additional um, value to be assigned to the park itself as well as friend group which is an easier way of more efficiently organizing volunteer resources so that um, to share some of those burden of maintenance if you wish. So those three are laid out and then um, we also laid out like if you want to pursue one of them, you need to consider these five different points going forward. That's great. 
that's great. Thanks. I want to pivot uh, my next question to um, taking us all back. Although um, the um, Nelson Bird team, I don't, I don't know if any of you were here, but taking us all back to one of the very first public input sessions about this, you know, three years ago maybe, um, where we were asked to write down not what did we want the space to be, but what did we want to do in this space? And my question is, of the many things that came out of that um, that session, how how many of those things have we been able to incorporate into this design? Can yeah. can the people of Asheville do what they wanted to do here? I, Absolutely. I, so, oh, excuse me. Oh, go, go. You go, Thomas. I, I was just going to say, um, Commissioner Mayfield, it is absolutely my, my deepest hope that they will recognize their own words in the activities that, um, that are offered by this public space. Um, the idea that the architecture would have community use um, is something that we've put into it. Um, I think we overwhelmingly heard uh, a safe public gathering space with benches and chairs and shade and beauty. Um, I, I know we definitely heard a lot from the community garden and we have protected that community garden uh, space and incorporated that into the design. Um, we, uh, in our conversations, talked about the history of the Cherokee and how, um, how much work there is to do uh, to talk about reparations with African American community, with reparations with the Cherokee community and a place of acknowledgement of the multiple layered cultural history has found a home in the park as well. So I think those descriptive terms uh, live on in the final in the final design in a substantial way. So since you just raised uh, reparations and kind of historic injustices, talk a little bit about how you see those issues being incorporated into this space? How how will someone come to this space and have have some sense of, of that? The um, upper, the northwestern corner across from the Basilica, um, we've allotted a substantial corner there of the park that is intended to not be in the midst of all the uh, circulation, uh, somewhat removed. Um, we we aspire to create a sense of contemplation and reflection and without having designed it in detail because we have not engaged uh, with the specific community to hear their voice. So we, it's, it's one of those things you want to hold space for someone else's story, but not try to design it without them present. There's also the complexity of saying this is something we're going to do, but it hasn't been voted upon and passed Council. So what we're really trying to do is hold a space for those conversations to happen as the design moves forward. And the aspiration is that someone would come here and find their voice, their story represented in this public plaza. That's great. Thank you. Very. Um, yeah, that's good. Um, another question that we've heard throughout this process, really, and it has come up again in one of the public comments we received yesterday is um, how, how do we, so I'll preface this by saying, you know, a lot of people are very frustrated at, at how Pritchard Park gets used and, and many would say abused. Um, and there are people in our downtown and our people in our community who feel like Pritchard Park isn't really a public park anymore. It's, its use has been taken over by a small number of people um, that um, these are, I'm saying this, I'm not necessarily agreeing with it, I'm simply relaying, but that there are a lot of folks who don't feel comfortable in Pritchard Park anymore given sort of the current use of it. So how how do we how do we make this a space that is for everyone, uh, including folks who are homeless, uh, including folks who live in million dollar condos? How how have you kind of ensured that this design will remain a space that everyone feels comfortable in. Right. Um, I will 
start with uh, part of an answer, but I think Stephanie Monsendal might have some comments uh, to add as well. But you know, we're designing public parks across the United States, and this is a constant uh, question. And the public space ends up where people experiencing homelessness find themselves. It's not that the park causes uh, the experience of homelessness, but the public space is the resulting repository or collecting point so often. Um, we try to strike the balance of safety for all through the design, through things like uh, circulation, lighting, not having horticulture that blocks the eye view, the mid range, but limbing up trees and using lower uh, shrub and perennial ground plane so there's good visibility. Uh, lighting that is not high glare lighting, but more eye level lighting that illuminates the ground plane. So more lights at a lower wattage actually allows you to see better at night rather than big, you know, the kind of blinding parking lot lights that you can see the light, but nothing beyond it. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that excites me about this site is the degree of circulation in and around it from the, the church, from Harrah's, from or the, the Civic Center, from the auditorium. Uh, lots of people live on either side. Further down at Pritchard Park, I don't think there are many people living on that site. And here you have lots of eyes on the street. In the famous words of Jane Jacobs, um, the, the health of your community is the eyes on the street, the eyes on the project. So I think this, this plaza finds itself at the intersection of a lot of movement and activity um, at, at this civic heart of Asheville. Um, unlike the civic buildings um, uh, where City Hall is, that building is empty by probably six o'clock at night. Um, many of the events unfolding here, evening church events, uh, mm -hmm. performances. So the, the activity of this plaza is stretched much longer into the day. I, I, there's no way to assure you that um, people experiencing homelessness will not come to this park. And it's not our intent to prevent them from ever coming to this park, frankly. Right. Um, we want this to be inclusive for all, but the more all there is, the more balanced it feels, and it's not uh, commandeered by any one population. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and then my last question is about the building. So um, you, I heard you say, I think, that your, envis your vision is that the south side of this building would be not just a plain brick wall or maybe even a plain wall with windows, but that it would have, at least at the ground level, there would be activity, there would be lots of people going through that alley way um, and I'm coming at this question kind of from the the point of view if if I lived in that adjacent building I mean you've you've just you've just taken away my view of the basilica you've just taken away you've taken away my view of some of the mountains um, you know what 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 will the experience be for those people with this building um, now adjacent to them and yeah well, this is uh, um, this is the urban center of your city, and it is uh, an urban condition. And buildings are on blocks. And I think part of the commitment to good planning is filling in missing teeth in cities. And I think someone who has chosen to live in the heart of the city, um, I imagine, expects to be on the grid in blocks um, with other buildings around them. I think the experience will be vibrant and uh, dynamic and that staircase uh, that is activated with retail or, or cafes or restaurants just brings the quality of so much of Broadway and Lexington um, into this development in what I think is a very positive way. We have been careful to, to not make choices that only favor the view of, of a handful of people. Rather, this building offers the view of the basilica to in that big open loggia across the facade to everyone. So suddenly the view that only a handful, like maybe four or five apartments have is now offered to the entire city. Um, and that's part of, I think, living in the, in the heart of the civic realm. Okay, great, thank you. 
those uh, those were all my questions. Gwen or Antoinette, do you have any any others? Oh, actually, I had one more. Sorry, um, and this is really for um, Stephanie. Was um, was the Office of Equity and Inclusion involved in the conversations and the 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 design conversations and that that we're seeing here today? Um, all staff was invited um, at the beginning of this project to participate. So um, we gave a, a presentation to department directors and then we invited all staff to the kickoff meeting and all of the public meetings. Um, so they were not directly engaged in coming up with strategies or the design. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Those are my, yeah. Uh, Antoinette or Gwen, anybody else? All right. And Stephanie, you are looking for a motion that would move this on to council recommending this concept plan. Is that is that what you're hoping to get today? That's, that's correct. Moving forward to council October 27th with a positive recommendation for the concept. Okay. All right. So before I open it for public comment, is there, is there a motion that someone would like to put on the table? And Gwen and Antoinette, you are off my screen at this point. There you go. I see Gwen now. Excuse me one second. Stephanie, can you restate the motion you're looking for? The part about the positive recommendation. That was a question for Stephanie or for me? Yes. Um, one second. I'm looking at for the staff report. So, yeah, we would be asking um, the Planning and Economic Development Committee to consider voting in the affirmative a recommendation to council to accept the plan and to consider it on October 27th. The other option for you um, is, because um, I know this is the first time for you seeing this in detail, perhaps could be to consider a motion um, to, for council to consider the plan at their October 27th meeting. And, and let me just say, um, Antoinette, because I did not understand this when I first got on council, that when council accepts something, that does not commit us to actually doing anything. <laughs> it just basically says, we hired a consultant, we told them what we wanted to do, they've done it, and we are now accepting the results of that work um, uh, as the sort of the next starting place when, when we move the conversation forward. Um, would that... Is that kind of an accurate statement? Actually, I, I would like to posit that um, while we have done that in the past, what we are going to be looking for at council is for you to adopt the plan. So adopting the plan also doesn't hold you to implementing the plan. This plan actually doesn't have an implementation section. Mm -hmm. And what staff will be doing when we come to council is recommending to you that you adopt the plan. It's almost like, um, it's almost as if what you did for the Riverside D Drive development plan during the entire rad tip and riverfront redevelopment process, you've adopted that plan. We use that as a guide to um, implement any of the improvements in, in the area, but it didn't hold you to do it exactly to how the plan was adopted, but having it adopted um, uh, is a, a much more um, standard way. I think that the accepting thing that we've done in the past, it was a political um, maneuver. Yeah, I, I think the effect though is the same, which is, well, it, at least is the way I intended it, which is this is we agree that this is a good place for us to be, and this is the this is where we will be. This is where we will start going forward. This is the this is the thing that we're working from going forward. And uh, that also would mean then that the um, equity office could subsequently be included. Yeah, and I and I heard um, uh, one of the consultants say, um, well, Mr. Wells, that that particularly in designing that area of contemplation that would 
um, be reflective of uh, in the Native American and African American culture in our in our city. That that there would be very specific outreach and engagement with those folks. And I would assume the Office of Equity and Inclusion would be involved in that conversation. And I'd also be interested in the building itself, having some inclusion or input from them as well with what that ends up being. Yeah. Um, I'd like to speak to that for uh, a second and just say that from staff's per perspective, this plan, as I mentioned, the, the front end leaves a lot of room for flexibility to consider the things that Councilwoman um, Mosley is discussing. And the, our approach to equity and inclusion with this plan is to is to use this to, to knit um, very specific partners together. And for example, the Basilica, the Civic Center, and the library are outstanding examples of how to create multicultural programming within their own um, individual units. And what we're hoping, you know, is that we can have a conversation about reparations where we look at not just, you know, reparations that address the, the denial of um, housing to create wealth, but that uh, the lack of equity in our community also um, denied access to recreation, education, and um, other opportunities that this place um, the special place can help rectify moving forward. So I think I think we have a huge opportunity here. All right. So I tell you what, let's let's open up. Everybody can be contemplating whatever motion they might like to make. Let's go ahead and open it up for public comment. Um, Jenna, do we have um, do we have folks on the line when just while you're Getting that ready, we did have two public comments that came in, one that expressed some of the concerns that I related today and the other, which was uh, actually, I guess we've gotten two um, that were very supportive of the of the design. We do not have anyone in the speaker queue. Okay, then. So do we have a motion? So I would make a motion to um, to forward this on to council at, and recommend adoption of this concept with no no implementation plan. Okay. A second. Great. All right. I will do a roll call vote. Um, Vice Mayor Whistler. Aye. Uh, Councilwoman Mosley. Aye. And myself, I am I as well. So that passes. Thank you all very much. This is. Um, uh, momentous, <laughs> not to be underestimated. And thanks very much to Steph and the rest of the staff for, for shepherding all of this through and to our consultants for being patient with us as we found the money to bring you on and help you, um, enable you to do this great work. Uh, and also, you know, to everyone who has been involved in this, there have been, I think, probably thousands and thousands of people who have provided input on this and uh, come to meetings and submitted comments and put up sticky notes and um, you know it's it's slow going but this is a this is a huge moment in this process and uh, I um, I very much appreciate everybody's work thank you thank you thank you council member we appreciate it yeah yeah all right. We are moving on. Mr. Walls, it doesn't mean that you can't stay and keep coming back to your home. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I hope it means I'll I'll be around even more. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I think as long thank as you. you keep doing good work here, we'll continue to. <laughs> okay, great. I hope the design is beautiful. It's beautiful. Thank you all. Well, and I have a wonderful team with uh, everyone on the on the call. So thank you so much. And I've really really enjoyed working with your city planning staff. They have been extraordinary, visionary, supportive, collaborative. It has been one of the most positive experiences I've had um, in, in with city planning in the design of parks and public space. So really a huge uh, congratulations to your planning department. That's, that is excellent. I'm, I'm not sure that anyone has ever described working on this site in the glowing terms that you just have. So. <laughs>
<laughs> well, you know, it, if it worked, it's because we listen. And I think too many people approach public space with their own agenda and they're not the repository, but then apply their creativity to a response. So that's why I say I really hope people will remember the comments they made and find them manifest someday in this public space. Thank you all very much. It's Thank now you. the slope of hope. The slope of hope. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Moving on to our next agenda item is our business inclusion policy. And for that, I am going to pitch it to, uh, is it Nikki? Or who, whoever's leading it? Sure, I'm happy just to introduce our team. Um, and I'll go ahead and introduce Rosanna Mulcahy. She's our Asheville Business Inclusion Office uh, Manager. And she will be providing a presentation today on the business inclusion policy. So Rosanna, do you need me to run slides or do you have it handled? We you do the slides? I'm sorry. Do it. Sure thing. So I think I can do this. So much easier that way. All you have to do is talk. <laughs> okay. And if you all can see that, Rosanna, just give me the signal and I'll advance as you need. Thank you. Um, and um, I know that Ms. Mosley was not here the last time, but we presented this to you um, once before. And um, we wanted to come back uh, once the policy was finalized. Um, and we have Erin here too, in case um, you have any legal questions that she may uh, answer for you. Uh, you can go ahead, Nikki. Thank you. Um, so the presentation is going to be a lot small, shorter. Uh, we're going to discuss um, the Asheville Business Inclusion Policy, um, additional guidelines that we would like to see implemented in, in the policy, and um, the implementation that we have still have to do, and some key dates for the policy. Go ahead, Nikki. Thank you. So... Um, uh, the, the main goal for the for this policy is to uh, enhance competition of our minority women business enterprise. Um, as as you know, the the disparity study was not um, very flattering. So um, we are working to make changes with this policy. So um, to enhance competition for MWBEs, uh, we are working on creating a database of minority women and small business enterprises that will enhance our awareness and utilization of these businesses in our region. Internal awareness. Um, the Business Inclusion Office will continue to provide support to ensure the growth of our MWSBEs in the Asheville region. We will continue to monitor and report the utilization, creation, and expansion of our MWSBEs. And of course, we are recommending our policy to uh, move from race and gender neutral to a race and gender conscious policy. You can go ahead, Nikki. Thank you. <clears throat> with, this, with this new policy, we seek to remediate the discrimination identified by the disparity study. The policy will allow for two types of goal settings based on the available uh, MWSBEs. The policy we also set standards for good faith efforts and expand the definition of lowest responsive responsible. Basically, as part of being responsive, the good faith efforts will be evaluated. The policy includes guidelines for a business database that will consist of available and, and certified MWSBEs. The policy also defines roles and responsibilities for key city personnel and advocates for other measures to promote inclusion in our city contracting. Go ahead, Nikki, thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, we also added um, some um, best practices and other policy guidance that, um, that other cities that are race and gender conscious uh, do, do follow. Um, so for this policy to be successful, the policy recommends other measures that remove barriers and allow for more opportunities, such as reviewing bonding requirements, reviewing projects uh, and purchases to allow for a smaller scope, provide networking opportunities, which we, pre-COVID, we were doing. 
Uh, we hope to continue that. Um, allocate funding and support for black spaces, such as making spaces, co-working spaces, and incubating spaces. Um, when I'm, last year we hosted a 16 week listen, listening section uh, for our black owned businesses. And this was one of the biggest um, barriers that we came across. And <clears throat> so we, we want to make sure that if we're creating businesses, if we're providing them with opportunity, that there's a space where they feel welcome, where they can um, grow their business and engage with other like-minded individuals. Um, <clears throat> and then of course, allocate funding for the future um, <clears throat> disparity studies. Go ahead, Nikki. So uh, some um, key dates, we would like to bring this to council on October 27th. We have uh, some implementation that we've started working on, but we really can't finish or start some of them until the policy gets passed. Um, we need to start certifying businesses uh, to develop that database that we'll be using to identify our available MWSBE firms. Um, we need to start setting goals for participation of our MWBEs. We need to identify upcoming opportunities and bidding opportunities with the city so that we can set those goals. Um, we will, um, we're already working on internal procedures for city employees to follow. And, um, and we need to start training our employees on how to follow um, these guidelines. There's external work to be done, which is already started, like developing an external manual. Um, the day after the policy passes, if it passes, I'm assuming first time doing this, so I don't know how things go. <laughs> so um, um, we're gonna have a, a press release and we're gonna invite the community to provide feedback on the external manual uh, so that it could be uh, available and it's easy to understand for everyone. And we also wanna, um, we wanna be able to have the policy be in effect on January 1st, 2021. And this is, uh, is, is very important to realize that if we do not have a disparity study finished by November 1st, 2023, uh, we would have to remove any um, part of the policy that refers to race and gender conscious. Um, so that's the presentation. Questions? Um, I do have a few questions, um, as I'm sure I'm sure we all do. Um, so t t tell me, the, the city already invests a fair amount of money, now some of it's federal pass-through dollars, CDBG funding, in partner organizations that are also that we are funding to help create and lift up minority owned businesses mountain bizworks um eagle market street um what tell me tell, tell me how how will this policy how will we make use and partner with those organizations to help advance the goals of this policy yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the things that we have been working with um, city manager um, and mind you some blank, uh, city manager, um, Mayor Mannheimer, uh, a few community members is, uh, for example, the co-working spaces or making spaces, just uh, black owned spaces. And um, as we were doing the homework for the uh, the spaces. Do we need to create, buy a building, refurbish it, and supply it for the black community? Uh, we realized that there are organizations out there uh, that are nonprofit and for profit who are doing uh, some sort of um, co working or um, incubating spaces, like like you said, Stephanie's. Um, um, Eagle Market Street that she does incubation. Uh, and then um, just not, not long ago, uh, the coffee shop that just, my name, just the name just went blank. Uh, right. the, grind, the grind just opened up and they're gonna be doing some stuff there. So um, I've done outreach to, uh, to both uh, organizations. Uh, I've spoken with both of them. Um, I'm talking with the YMI. I'm trying to speak with Pastor Grant. Uh, 
and other organizations that have shown interest in doing stuff like that. Uh, so instead of um, building and taking away opportunity from the existing organizations, like we, if we don't want to take someone who's going to be doing business with Grind, we don't want to take their uh, the business away from Grind, right? We want to be able to support their business in order for that business to grow. So uh, the way we are envisioning that uh, collaboration, um, and I'm using that this specific the the co-working space. Uh, um, as an example, we are looking at developing a partnership um, in which the city provides support for those uh, organizations that are providing some co-working, meeting space, incubating space, and then look at what's missing and then filling the gaps while still providing support. So we will continue to... Um, to work with those organizations. Another organization that you mentioned was Mountain Business Works. Um, we, um, and you mentioned CDBG funds. CDBG funds, and you know this, I'm sorry, but I need to say it, does not only go to our black communities, it's, it's low, low to moderate income individuals. So when you have uh, organizations that are seen as, um, I hope Mountain Business Works don't get this wrong, because I love Mountain Business Works, um, you know, that are seen as white, mostly white organizations where uh, the black community don't feel welcome and accepted. We want to continue to work with Mountain Best Works, but we also have to realize that there's that gap there. And I know they're working on a, um, a program and I was invited to be part of it. So I should know the name, but I don't know the name. So we will continue to work with these organizations. We, we do not plan to put any of these organizations aside. This is this will enhance um, opportunities and open up doors for our businesses so that they can feel more comfortable going to Mountain Miss Works and applying for a loan because now they have a contract with the city and now they have the collateral that they need to do so. That's yeah. an example. That's that's great. That's very helpful. I mean, you know, we <clears throat> again we we fund. I'll just we'll keep using Mountain Biz Works um, because it is the. The, of the three groups that are funded together in that program, it's the one that's that's sort of white run, um, you know. But we fund each of those organizations to the tune of I think you know fifty to seventy thousand um, dollars, maybe even more every year. And if 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 the if the intended audience, if the target audience, which is um, people of color who want to start businesses, are not taking advantage of that to the degree that we need them to, then 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 we need to do some additional work there. Um, and so if, the, you know, if the, I, I, I don't know what that is, but <laughs> um, that, that would seem, that would seem important. Um, another question I have is, um, so this policy, this policy does not, um, it, it does not create, and I'm, I'm just trying to get clarity so everybody can, everybody's saying the same thing. This does not create a preferential hiring situation. Is that correct? I mean, the way that I read this is the way that we are trying to redress the disparity is to increase the number of minority and women owned businesses and small business enterprises. We're trying to know more of who those are. We're trying to provide some support for them. We're trying to help them get certified. We are creating a new standard of good faith efforts that contractors need to need to show us. But I don't read anywhere in the policy. I mean, the policy that still says, you know, um, I, I don't have it right in front of me, but the policy still says, um, you know, uh, lowest responsible bidder. Lowest responsible bidder, race neutral. The policy still says all of that stuff. Um, so, so just well, talk a little bit about that. It, and you're right, Julie. It does not require preferential treatment. What it does is allows us to set specific goals on specific contracts by using the disparity study to give these contractors a list of, of, con of minority women and small business enterprises who are certified with the city that they can use on their contracts. And they have to meet the good faith efforts for each goal that is not met on the contract. 
So for example, if a construction contract has a 2% minority business goal on that per contract for subcontracting goals, if that goal is not met, that contractor would have to submit good faith efforts as to what they did to reach out. And we've outlined those in the policy. They're very much similar to those that are already in place for HUB, for the Historic Unalyzed Business for in North Carolina, as well as we looked at other policies and they're very similar. So the contractors, these good place efforts are not going to be new. These are things that they've already seen and that they should already be doing, which is expanding that for all of our contracts, not just those that are in construction, 300,000 for the hub hub, um, area. So it's not creating set asides. You're, they, the contracts are still selected based on the lowest responsive responsible bidder the good faith efforts allows us to determine if the, the documentation is not there, we that that bid is non-responsive. Okay. And then we move to the to the next lowest if the the first one is not responsive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Those were my questions, uh, Antoinette. Okay. I think this question is for you, Erin. Just um, a definitional question: a husband and wife contracting firm, does that firm count in this policy as an MWSBE? It would depend on the makeup of the the, the managerial practice. So we built in, so they would, for the policy we have, if they're 51% female, there would be a minority women I'm sorry, a women business enterprise, if it's 51% of one of the minority groups that are identified in this very study, which we've outlined in the policy, then that would be a minority business enterprise, all of which, if they fall under the threshold of, I believe we said it at $250,000 their um, net each year, that would, they would qualify for a small business enterprise and they could be certified as such. Um, if we have set up and we, are also when for the managerial structure, they would have to submit some sort of documentation that for that managerial structure, that one of those qualifying persons is for that certifying entity that SBE, MBE, or WB is part of the managerial practice. And we've talked about in, in our contracts as well as in our certification process that they would then agree to a possible managerial audit if we found out for some reason that they were in fact not truthful on their certification process because most of this certification process would be done through affidavits well uh, when certifying with Rosanna's department okay thanks yeah go ahead Gwen um I've, I'm not sure who this question goes to but um there there were when I read through the draft plan uh, or draft policy, excuse me, uh, there were several areas that were excluded. I mean, one one that came up was legal. Um, is there is there a plan somehow to um, later on down the road start to? exclude less of these contracts. It just seemed like there were there were quite a few areas of carve out that we said it's not going to apply to these kind of contracts. I realize that we've opened it up for a lot more contracts than previously we did, but is there any sort of plan to uh, you know, ha have less carve outs? And I guess I can answer that question. We have not discussed that, but that is an area that we can look into. Um, like I said, this this policy is going to evolve as implementation goes through. So I believe once we get a good procedures and implementation, that would allow us the opportunity to then make sure that we're still consistent with state, federal, and local laws to see where we can limit that list of excluded and exempt contracts going forward. So I definitely think that's an area that we can look into going forward. I'm, I'm sure Rosanna and Nikki would agree with that. Okay. And um, to whom does the uh, business inclusion manager report to? Me, I report to Nikki. To Nikki, and then Nikki reports to Sam. Okay. So, Kathy, sorry. Um, thank you. Um, 
So, um, just a suggestion or a question, I guess, is why wouldn't this be under the Equity and Inclusion Department? And secondly, given that, um, uh, given that the ultimate responsibility for this is at the city manager's office, and there's an awful lot in the policy that says the business inclusion manager reports on X, Y, and Z directly to the city manager. Um, I, I just, I mean, it's sort of a funny, I guess I just organizationally didn't like fully understand where this sits. Yeah, I can I can um, answer this, and I think we're we're open to where um, council wants to go. But I will tell you from the standpoint of folks doing business with the city that falls in our economic development department. So uh, minority business has always been a part of our economic development department. So trying to engage community members and minority community businesses has always fallen in there with the, it, with the assistance of trying to engage people. Our equity and inclusion office primarily has been set up to help um, staff and help the organization in several different departments understand how equity and inclusion fits into all the roles that we do. So this office has done this outreach and have, has used the resource of the Equity Inclusion Office, but they support, much like human resources, they support all the departments in understanding how to implement policies correctly and how to um, accomplish the goals of the whole city. So they serve as a resource for all the city. So they don't necessarily, it's not necessarily their job to be outward facing in terms of bringing in businesses. That's That's been the goal of the economic development department. Does that make sense? But the yeah, I, I see what you're saying. And I, right, I see what you're saying, but I think, I, and maybe, you know, this is a bigger conversation, um, but I think there's an awful lot of people out in the, the world um, and in Asheville and possibly even council who, who uh, maybe doesn't fully grasp this, you know, that equity and inclusion, our department is kind of internally focused and then this area would be externally focused. Right. I'm not sure we um, have all embraced that concept. So um, let's, I, you know, again, you don't need to, it, it was just really a question for me. And then, um, and this is just speculative and I'm just trying to get a sense of this. I mean, I know, Rosanna, we've gone through with the um, disparity study, you know, we've identified um, or at least preliminarily identified the resources out there from the from all the various MWSBE firms in the in the area um, and and it will be your job or somebody's job to like keep that list up. My question is, what's your sense of the effect of COVID-19 on this list? I'm pretty, con I mean, and I'm, I'm concerned that um, at least things I'm reading and not necessarily in the Asheville area, but COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting uh, affecting this targeted group specifically. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm anticipating that, gosh, that list that was derived a year ago or whenever it was with, um, with the disparity study is going to be substantially smaller than it was. And so do you agree with that? And what, if anything, can this, <laughs> can this policy do to help um, build that, in, for lack of a better expression, inventory of the number of firms that fit into this policy? That was a really long question. <laughs> I'm sorry. So um, yes, um, our, unfortunately, our um, black and brown businesses have been the most impacted by COVID. Not only businesses, but also uh, just people. 
Um, so, but, we're, we're, but but I'm here to address businesses, right? So um, the the list that um, we received from um, the disparity study uh, group, uh, BBC Research, I think it was. Um, it was a list of about um, less than, less than 400 business. This list included all. Um, able, willing, and ready businesses in a 10-county region. And when it came to professional services, it also included Charlotte. So think about like 400 businesses, 10 counties, Charlotte. Um, When you scroll through those businesses, you will find that there were approximately 73 women-owned businesses in that list, about 17 black owned businesses. Uh, There were five Latinos um, and I believe there were five um, Asian Americans and Native Americans. So you you see this huge list and there's only this number of of businesses. And that, I I asked them this question, how how do you know that a business is able, willing and ready? What what is your criteria? Because able, I mean, it's, you know, it's, uh, I guess, objectives, um, willing, I guess, if the person wants to do business with us, and ready, how do you define ready? So to me, that was the main word when I when I read the disparity study, how do you define ready? So um, there's, there at the time, there were so many businesses, but this the actual community has a wealth of black owned businesses that all they need is a little bit of support from us to grow, to expand, to create jobs, to create wealth for their family. And I think that's that the um that is the inventory that I hope to expand to the to the point where they're not just uh, able and willing, but they are ready to do the work. So, um, so to me, there are businesses out there. We just have to uh, in, continue to engage them and provide them with what they need. Uh, like I said, we have a wealth of black-owned businesses that could um, do this work. They, they may just need help um, getting uh, bonded, or they may need help being able to uh, get a prompt payment so that they can pay their employees so that they can able, they're can they able to finish that contract. So uh, we have a pool to work from. If that was your question, we have a pool to develop, but we have to work and invest in our Black businesses. And Rosanna, could I ask you to expand a little bit on the, the proposal that we're making to be able to certify those businesses here without them having to go through the state hub system, which is a lot more cumbersome and has a lot more re- stringent requirements. So the, the requirements for them to do business with us is going to be, I'll let you explain it, but that should lower the hurdle for people being able to get their foot in the door to be able to do business with the city as well. Uh, absolutely. So, um to be able to be hub certified um, for some businesses, it is not a barrier. It's something that they can go ahead and do. Um, one of the things that I usually come across when I try to assist businesses to become certified is, let me see your financials because um, hub office is saying, we need to see your financials for the last two years. Um <clears throat> these businesses do not have the capacity to maintain a current uh, QuickBooks or maintain a current uh, balance sheet or income statement. Uh, So their financial statements are are not up to date. So so they lack that capacity to to have someone um, do that for them or them do it for themselves because they're not working, you know. Um, So with our certification for our MWS uh, for M- our MWBE, we'll be looking at um, business formation. Um, if there's sole, pro- hard for me to say this word, sole proprietorship, uh, we will still accept them, but we will help them become uh, have uh, 
have a legal entity, you know, with the state of North Carolina. We will guide them through that process, but we will uh, accept them as a business. Of course, they have to be Black, Latino, Native American, Asian American, you know. We will accept them. We will certify them, and they have to be living within the 10-county region that the disparity study described. So once they satisfy those things, we will certify them they will start getting opportunities to contract with the city of Asheville because they have to be certified and they have to be registered with the city of Asheville before they can get the opportunity. So as they're working through with the city of Asheville, gaining contracts, meeting people, gaining experience, we're going to be working with them to get their financials up to date, get them, um, get their business, um, uh, registered with the state of North Carolina, get, uh, looking for insurance, looking for all those things. So we're not going to be, they're not going to be waiting for an opportunity until they're able to, to meet all the requirements that the hub office says. So once we are able to get them to where the hub office uh, wants them to be, then they're going to graduate and they're going to move on to the hub office. Uh, to hub certify or D or uh, DBE with NC uh, DOT, you know those are certifications that require certain things that we are going to not ask for because we understand that the businesses do not have the capacity at this moment to provide us with that stuff. So uh, uh, that's how um, having our own certification is going to help us grow those business so that they can grow and graduate to the hub office. Does that explain, Kathy? I think so. I would ask the council members on the PED committee if that helped at all. I mean, it may have been overkill, but we're just trying to provide support because we know that a lot of those 400 have gone out of business, they've lost, and now we're trying to help rebuild them through this and, process. And, and th that is why, and, and the sad part, because they, they do not have their financials, they may not be, um, they may be, I shouldn't say this, commingling funds, which should never be done with the business, but they don't know this, right? Um, they did not qualify for PPE, but they, for PPP or, or any any of those government stuff. They didn't qualify for any of those things. and. and, and, and and then even like the state grants um, and and loans, uh, they don't qualify for those. You know, like and right now the hub office has created this amazing program, but you have to be certified with the hub office to to be able to qualify. But if the businesses are not ready, once again they're going to be left out. And we continue to do this by not providing the opportunity or meeting the business where they're at. And I think that this is where the policy is going to be effective. We're meeting the business where they're at and helping them move along. And, and so Rosanna, is it, you, you may have said this, but is it, is it our vision that for instance, that will be your job to help groups get, you know, get their financials in order and learn QuickBooks. And I mean, who's, who is physically going to be doing that? And so, that's that's a threshold question. And then, who? How do they? How do they keep that capacity going forward? I mean, the city is not going to keep the books of hundreds of organizations, but they may not. We have a. I, I, I wouldn't want to keep QuickBooks of my own business. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to keep QuickBooks of my own business. The, the city currently has a contract with the Mountain Business Equity Initiative, which was an initiative that started after our 16-week listening session with the Black business community. The city is currently funding this, um, this business owners who are also the, the leaders and are also the people teaching. Uh, there's currently a cohort happening the next cohort which will start at the end of uh, or the middle of December. So uh, we've already put in place, as long as it gets funded uh, year after year, we've already put in place this um, branch 
I'm going to call it like a branch of the Asheville Business, Business Inclusion Office that is in charge of uh, providing this technical assistance. And, and the goal is uh, partnering with like, for example, if we don't have someone who can dedicate their time to teach QuickBooks, partner with Mountain Missworks. I'll call Matt, I'll call, I'll call whoever's there and I'll be like, hey, could we do a class? We've done that with SBTDC. We've done that with... Um, Western Women Business Center. We've done it with self-help. Uh, and we, we continue to do that and, and continue partnering with those uh, agencies that uh, have more resources. But we already have a, a, a teaching training branch of the Asheville Business Inclusion Office. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, other questions, Antoinette or Gwen? All right, and I think you are on this point also looking for a motion to uh, uh, vote to approve and move forward to council. So, is there a? Do you want to? Do you want to see if there's any public comment, Julie? Oh, sorry, thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, I was going to get the motion on the table first, Gwen. Well, okay. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> then I will make a motion to uh, for, to approve this policy and forward it to council. But you you. You, that's not the way you did it the last time. So I was just. I know. I asking. tried to do it that way last time. It just didn't work. So we have a motion. Is there a second? Well, I'll second that motion. Okay, great. And so, <laughs> Jenna, do we have anybody on the line for public comment? There's no one in the speaker queue. Okay, great. All right. We have a motion and a second. I'll do a roll call vote. Vice Mayor Whistler? Aye. Councilwoman Mosley? Aye. And I am also I, so that passes as well. Thank you all. I know this has been Thank a huge effort. Thank you, Nikki, yeah. Rosanna, Aaron. Really great, yeah. great work. It's a lot. You can tell that it's been a lot of work, and um, and it will be going forward too. But um, really great strides here. Yep. yep. Hopefully, you know, it's one more, one more move along the equity and inclusion spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. Great work. All right. Final agenda item update on the suspension of city urban renewal properties. I think that's the suspension and disposition of, um, and that is also Nikki. So Nikki, tee this up for us. Great. Hi, committee members. My name is Nikki Reed. I'm the economic development program director. And so last time that we met with PED, we shared a project that the city is working on to map any of the property that it currently owns that um, came through urban renewal. And when we uh, discussed that with PED at the last meeting, we talked about identifying the boundaries, just the general overall boundaries of the areas of our city where urban renewal occurred. And then also to identify any property that the city currently owns that it came to own through urban renewal. Um, so we talked about that mapping project and that work continues and is ongoing. Um, I think at the time PED also directed staff to come back um, with, at the time we called it a, a moratorium on the sale of city property, but you see we've changed the language just a bit um, to be clear on, on what it means um, and, and use the word suspension rather than moratorium. That was the advice of, of legal. So right now we're putting forward um, a resolution and we're asking the committee to endorse it, um, to ask city council to direct the city manager to suspend the sale of any city property acquired through urban renewal. Um, with the idea being that we're going to look at further policy direction um, that would ultimately be reviewed by the reparations commission on how to align the efforts of the reparations resolution that was passed by council earlier this year and these properties that the city came to own through urban renewal. Um, I think one of the key tenets of that resolution, the reparations resolution, um, was to acknowledge and seek to amend um, for the city's role in urban renewal. And so connecting that with the property that it now owns that came through urban renewal was um, the overarching policy direction there. Um, so we're still working on that list. I think we hope to, to be able to really share that out when we have the map ready and when we can better um, understand um, all, all the components of the history. I mean, um, urban renewal in Asheville is at least a 50-year history to understand. The Reparations Commission was established sometime in the 50s. And so that's a, that's a lot to unpack and really understand how the city came to own these properties and what happened. Um, during pro projects such as the dollar lot program and 
and all the other things that we, we've talked about, but to really understand the city's role in that and, and what we have, um, um, the properties that we have left that we may want to um, sell for, for, for reparations um, uh, amendment there. So I think um, we are gonna take this step with putting forward the suspension of sale um, and then thereafter be able to work on that policy, which I think at that point will be the appropriate time to really unpack all the, 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 the points along the way, all the ways in which the city came to own the property and really tell that story in order to inform how policy would then unfold. So um, I, I do think it's also important that we have two exemptions that we are also um, putting forward at the same time that we're putting together um, this resolution. And so those two exemptions are basically property that we already have in the works um, to be sold. And so the, the first set of properties was 172 and 174 South Charlotte Street. Those properties are currently under contract to be sold to White Labs. I was looking back at the staff report that we had put forward um, to City Council at the time, and we did go ahead and map out at the time, this was May of, of 2019, we had gone ahead and done a survey to show the properties that the city got through urban renewal and the properties that the city had owned previously. It's kind of a, um, it's, it's both and in that case for these two properties. There's both property that the city owned previously, you know, there's a historic building there at White Labs, and then there's other properties that the city then later came to own that is now assembled into that large site. Um, so at the time we did provide council with that information and talked about the fact that any sale of property that's affiliated with urban renewal, those proceeds go into our community development block grant fund. Um, so due to the fact that that's already underway and those properties are under contract, we are asking that an exemption for those properties be included um, with the forthcoming resolution to council. And then also the city's been um, looking at a property on Ashland Avenue. It's about a one acre site. And we've been um, reviewing that site for potential affordable housing. Um, and we've drafted the affordable housing policy um, such that we hope that it aligns with the, the needs to um, ensure that affordable housing is, is, is equitable in our community. So we're hoping to exempt that property as well, just because those two sites were currently in the works. So that's um, in essence what we have in the staff report. And that's in essence what we will be sharing with council at the end of the month on the 27th. And so I'm happy to answer any questions um, and and hopefully get a, 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 I am seeking a recommendation for that approval to council. Okay. Thanks, Nikki. Um, just a couple couple of uh, points of clarification or, or fleshing out those two particular examples that would be exceptions to this the, on the White Labs. This, this agreed, agreement to sell was part of an economic development deal that was done like two years ago, three years ago, before we started having this conversation. Is that right? It's actually about five years ago that we initiated with White Labs. So um, that deal was done in 2015. Um, at the time, it was a lease of the property to White Labs. And the incentive was basically that at the end of the five-year period, they would be able to purchase it. So basically, it allowed them during that five-year period um, to complete their uh, renovation of the property, hire the individuals that are working there now, and then ultimately purchase the property from the city. Okay. Okay. So really long before we were having this conversation, because <laughs> that was actually before everybody was on council except Gwen and Esther. Gwen and, except Gwen and Esther. So <laughs> five of us were not here then. Um, and then the other, we have been in conversations with the potential partner on that for uh, well over a year year and a half, I don't know how, but again, this is, it's not like these conversations just started last month. This has been a long, a long standing project. And is that right? Correct. We've been looking at that site for quite some time um, for the creation of affordable housing. And right now looking at targeting um, lower incomes. And so we're hopeful that that's something that council will consider. But of course it will be, when we have the a proposal fully fleshed out, it will be brought before council to approve. That's right. Um, yeah. That's right. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make it clear to anybody who's watching that, you know, we, these are not willy nilly exemptions. These are, these exemptions are being recommended um, for, for very good reasons. Um, I do have a question. Um, yes, please. As it relates to those properties seeking uh, property exemption, what would be the legal ramifications of breaching each of those contracts? 
Um, well, I'm not sure I would need to pull up the current agreement with um, White Labs. So technically speaking, the, the property at White Labs, so 172 and 174 South Charlotte Street, um, that is the only property that is currently under contract. Um, the property on Ashland is 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 not yet um, formed in any kind of legal agreement. So, um, and the properties at 172 and 174, uh, White Labs has exercised their option to purchase. So at that point, um, I would need to go back and look at that real estate contract to determine what a breach would be. Um, but we also have an economic development agreement um, that sets forth the relationship between the city and White Labs. So that would also need to be reviewed in terms of a breach. So can you go back a little bit and tell me about the property where we're hoping to get affordable housing? You said there is not an agreement yet? Current, right, that is correct. Um, we're just we're in conversations right now with an, an agency who's looking to create affordable housing um, just to determine if that's a suitable site for that purpose. But we've really taken no um, council action at this point or we have not either discussed it with the HCD yet. Can you give me a little info on the demographic makeup of that? Yeah, yeah. I think the, what they're looking at is I think it's a total of something like 41 units with all units being affordable to incomes at 80% and below with a special emphasis on lower income individuals at the 30% area median income and below. So much more focused on people who are experiencing chronic homelessness um, and, um, and that demographic. And can you give me demographic info on the developer? Um, right now the developer, um, so it's the Haywood Street Congregation um, and the Haywood Street Congregation is located there on uh, Patton Avenue. Um, Brian Combs is the lead pastor there and he's been um, having those conversations about that property. Okay. Yeah. And, and again, this is the Haywood Street Congregation has been trying to find a property to build housing for their community for, well, I've been in conversations with them about it for at least three years, if not longer. They were hoping to do it on their property, across from their property, and then now this, um, the property, uh, actually, anyway, the property down the street from Ashland. So, so they are, they are trying to build housing for their community. Um, well, I'm familiar with them. Thanks yeah. for that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Nikki, what the proposal that I saw is 20 units at or below 20% AMI, eight units at or below 60% AMI, and 14 units at or below 80% AMI. And that totals, the to that's the total unit. So it's, it's it, I, I mean, the vast majority is way below 80%. And, and I would say the other thing is that, you know, there, sorry, Nikki, the, 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 com, the, 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 there are multiple funding partners that are going to be coming into this, not just the city. And depending on how much the other partners put on the table, that, that amount, being, you know, the, the number of units available at lower incomes could come down. Is that, Kathy, is that fair to say? Yes. So when, anytime we say at 80%, that's 61 or 60.1 up to 80. So it's a range. I think sometimes we say 80% and people think it's 80% or we say 60%, but it's anybody between the range of the next lowest level. And I, it, Madam Chair, if it's okay with you, I would I would like to do a huge shout out to the staff. The last two items that you see have clearly been identified on the, as on the I think what we previously, previously called the 30, 60, 90 day plan as ways that we can improve the way we do business in the community for our black and brown residents. So I just wanna take this opportunity to kind of call those out as things that have somewhat been in the works, but you'll also see them on the plan. Um, to, to further improve business opportunities and living opportunities for our black and brown community members. Great, thank you, Kathy. Um, other questions for Nikki from the committee? 
Okay. Um, do we have a motion and then we'll go to public comment? Actually, before you make your motion, actually, sorry, sorry, I had one suggestion. Nikki, so this, right now, the recommendation is around suspending the sale of city-owned land uh, acquired through uh, urban renewal. What, what do you also think about the sort of, um, uh, I don't know how to say this, but like, you know, the city could decide, well, we're going to put a fire station here, or we're going to, you know, we could, we could make decisions to, to use the land in a way that um, doesn't, it, the, we're not selling the land, but we're sealing the fate of the land, so to speak. Um, so what, what um, would it be, would it be opening it up enormously broadly to, to include both the, we won't sell and we won't sort of, you know, permanently fix the future of, I don't know, however you'd say that. Um, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. And I, and I would have to think about it because I don't, I'm not aware of anything in the works. I mean, and, and I think once we get the map together to really understand how the property is currently being used. Um, so for example, the thing, things that come to my mind are Montford Park and the properties surrounding Montford Park to better understand what parts of the park, how it evolved to be that way. So it could be that we, we are using those sites currently for recreation right. um, that we, we may need to look at that. So I think um, that's the only issue I would see is just understanding that there might be a conflict with that current use that we're just not aware of. But I see yeah. like future use Right. That's what I'm focusing on is future use that we also we won't sell and we won't make any commitments around the future use of property that we own. And again, until we get these recommendations. I'm not seeing a problem with that. I mean, I think I think it's too so long as we have the exemption language, if we do come into conflict, that's something that we can consider. Mm -hmm. So I'm not seeing a problem with that or thinking of any issues that would be okay. um, that would make that problematic. Does that, yeah, go ahead, Gwen. Yeah, and I, I think that that makes some sense. And also um, the, the other thing that, you know, when this goes to council, um, the Ashland Avenue property, I mean, you know, what I would say is, you know, if talks break down with the people that we're currently um, talking to, then we take out the exemption for that. I mean, I think I think what you're trying to do is sort of protect our our um, negotiations with them right now. But again, if and I don't even know how you would say this in a staff report, but you know, if if it breaks down with that particular um, developer, I would say then we would take that property back and say, okay, it's no longer is exempted. We'd want that to be, you know, any sale. I, I would agree with that because it's not just any affordable housing. It's this particular partner <laughs> building the particular kind of housing for the particular kind of people that they serve. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think that. Gwen, do you want to put all that in a motion? <laughs> um, I would like to make a motion. To, I will make a motion to approve the recommendation to city council to to recommend to city council to approve a resolution directing the city manager to suspend the sale of any city property acquired through urban renewal until further policy direction has been reviewed by the reparations commission, unless specifically exempted by city council. And I will leave it to Nikki to revise the staff report to reflect our discussions. So that's my motion. Okay, okay great, motion and a second. Um, I'll do a roll call, uh, Vice Mayor Whistler. You want to check on public comment? Oh, sorry, yes, golly Moses, I just keep getting, anyway. Uh, Jenna, do we have anybody on the line? We do not. Okay, all right. Now, Vice Mayor Whistler. Aye. <laughs> and Councilwoman Mosley. Aye. Uh, and I am also an aye. Uh, great, well, again, thank you, Nikki and the staff. That's um, it's just a lot of really good work today going out going out on a bang. 
So well, now, and I think this last one, um, I think it was always the intention of the city manager to do this, but I think um, it will add a little bit more confidence in the city by actually having this as a resolution. Yeah, that's right. So I appreciate that. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, I think we are moving on to regular general public comment. Uh, Jenna, do we have anybody on the line for general public comment? There is no one in the speaker queue. Wow, we did so many things today and it seems like nobody paid attention. That's so sad. <laughs> they may be paying attention, but they just know we do great work and they don't need to tell us what to do. Okay, that's great. I guess when we're doing the right thing, nobody nobody needs to tell us what to do. Um, all right, so we are uh, all finished and I think I will declare us adjourned, but our next meeting is, uh, let me just look real quick be November 9th. Yeah, November 9th. Um, and that will be my last meeting. I'm going to start saying that a lot. So help me get over my separation anxiety. All right. Good. Good to see you all. Thank you, staff. Excellent work. And um, we'll see you again soon. Bye. Thank you all.